to you and welcome back to Closing Arguments. I'm your host tonight, Julie Grant. I'm in all this week just helping out for Vinnie Politan. He'll be back next week. Don't worry, uh, I miss him too. And I'll be back on my show opening statements as well next week. We kick off this hour in Austin, Texas, friends, where Caitlin Armstrong has been in court all week as the attorneys are battling over her freedom. So she's charged with killing Anna Mariah Wilson, goes by Mo. Uh, Mo was an up and coming cyclist who was found shot to death in her apartment. And prosecutors say that Armstrong murdered Mo Wilson in a jealous rage over fellow cyclist Colin Strickland. It was a love triangle, they say. Strickland had been dating Armstrong on and off, but reportedly had a brief relationship with Mo Wilson as well. And earlier that day, Armstrong had allegedly discovered that the pair were hanging out together. Now, some shocking footage was introduced as case evidence from a neighbor's ring doorbell camera. And it captures on the audio Mo Wilson's tortured screams just as she was about to be killed. The Messenger YouTube page posted the video. Uh, you don't see anything, but you can hear the screams and you can hear the gunshots. So just want to give you a warning. This may be difficult to watch. To get their thoughts on that disturbing footage, I'm going to bring in tonight's think tank. Joining us in the studio tonight, criminal defense investigator Charles Middlestadt. Also with us, criminal defense attorney Sudi Chada Jimenez and family law attorney and law professor at Emory University, Randy Kessler with us as well. Gentlemen, good evening. Wonderful uh, to have you all here tonight. Ooh, that piece of evidence is chilling, isn't it? Uh, Randy, to you first, your reaction hearing it. Chilling. It's horrible. Yeah. It's real. It brings it home. You know, it's such a new world that you can actually hear when a murder happens. But does it help anything? I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. It's prejudicial. I don't know that it's probative of anything. Mm -hmm. We don't know who was firing the shots, right? We know she was screaming. She was in terror, uh, clearly in fear of her life. And then you hear the gunshots just a couple of seconds after that. But who pulled the trigger? Uh, we don't know. Police think they know. They say it's Caitlin Armstrong. Uh, Sudi, if you're on the defense side um, and you do criminal defense practice, that's a bad piece of evidence coming in against your client. You know it's bad. How do you embrace it as a defense attorney? It absolutely is bad because, again, it brings the connection to your, just, your visceral reaction that you can hear somebody dying. Literally, you're hearing somebody die at that moment. But what does that have to do with my client? It doesn't show, we, it's not proving anything we don't already know. We know the person died and we know it died by gunshot. That's only verifying that. It doesn't go to prove who did it, why. If they knew each other, you would have heard, oh no, such and such is in my house. Get out of here, what are you doing here? No, we don't hear that. We hear surprise, which most likely could be a, uh, a stranger, a, somebody committing a burglary and shooting in the, in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, Sudi, because we know that Caitlin Armstrong knew who Mo Wilson was, but whether Mo Wilson had any idea who Caitlin Armstrong is is a whole nother story, and you're right, she doesn't identify her on that audio if Caitlin is the shooter. Uh, thank goodness we have that audio. Charles, I want to pick your brain about that. It's coming from a neighbor's ring doorbell camera. Um, walk us through what police do to try to gather pieces of evidence like that after a homicide. Well, they're going to they're gonna canvas, um, and so that's one of the first things they're going to do. And as a priority in a case like this, you're going to be looking for all of the perishable evidence, the stuff that is, has, you know, expiration dates that could be taped over, could, could disappear. And certainly video surveillance um, is one of those things. Um, and so they would have immediately identified any potential witnesses that would uh, either have ear testimony, eye te eyewitness testimony. Uh, or maybe in possession of some, um, in this case, digital evidence that could be uh, important. Now, uh, on its own, obviously, it, it, as these gentlemen have um, pointed out, it, you know, it doesn't prove anything, but the problem is the connectivity. If you can put her in the area, if you can show some of the other connectivity, that's when it takes on some significance in the case, and that's when it becomes really problematic. You're right, Charles, you're right. Uh, we want to get into a little more of that now, as a matter of fact. So during today's testimony, the jury got to learn more about Caitlin Armstrong's online activity following the murder. So on May 12th, just a day after Mariah Wilson was discovered dead on her bathroom floor, Armstrong deleted a search that she had made for 1704 Maple Avenue, Moe's address. 
Uh, she created an alias Gmail account and then purchased a Southwest flight from Austin to New York City. Then the next day, May 13th, she received an offer for her Jeep Grand Cherokee, which was spotted outside of Moe's home during the time of the murder. And she, she created a second alias Gmail account. Finally, on May 18th, a week after the murder, Armstrong purchased a flight to San Jose, Costa Rica. She also began a subscription for a VPN service and created a Skype account then. So, Charles, back to you. When you couple <clears throat> that ring doorbell camera footage and the audio that's so key on that with these other actions by Caitlin Armstrong, what does it tell it's, you? It's daunting evidence. It's, it's very difficult to overcome because a lot of this is going to be irrefutable, right? It's not, you're not, you can't challenge it um, the way you would testimonial evidence where there's... Uh, there's some subjectivity that's involved. There's a certain amount of uh, a degree of reliability that you place upon someone's testimony based upon their, their credibility, et cetera. This is irrefutable. These are, these are actions that are directly connected to her. Mm -hmm. um, the evidence of flight, um, the, the activity on some of these third-party apps, right. the fact that she searched uh, Mo Wilson's address. These are things that are very difficult to mm -hmm. disconnect her from. Right. And in, in order to be successful in defending her, you, you would have to be able to do that. And I think that's going to be a big, big challenge. Definitely. We saw some more Google searches come in uh, during today's testimony as well. A couple of them that Armstrong made following the murder. Uh, one of them, quote, can pineapples burn fingerprints? Another one, quote, Mariah Wilson murder. And another one, Caitlin Armstrong. So Googling her own name. Um, Randy Kessler, what do those searches perhaps tell you if you're on the side of the prosecution? God, just zip it, right? Yeah. That's what, <laughs> you got nothing. The state's got nothing. And then all of a sudden, you know, why would you try to hide that? It's like the person running away, you know, evidence of flight. You know, you're trying to cover up. She's going to give them a case. And if she's not careful, that's all they're going to need. I don't know that 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 we saw is enough to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. But, you know, giving them more than they had before she did any of that. Right, Randy. And as you know, prosecutors love the flight as consciousness of guilt instruction. Sudi, I'm coming to you next because, you know, you've served as a prosecutor. You do criminal defense practice now. Uh, but that's always an ay yeah ay kind of thing when you're on the defense side because it looks bad. Somebody flees. Here she fled twice to Costa Rica the first time and then the other time here. Look at this. This poor officer trips trying to catch her. She's going to a doctor's appointment, tries to jump the fence in her black and white striped jail jumpsuit uh and uh, he grabs her up puts her back in the car apparently she was training for this i read uh, working out getting ready to try to run if you're her defense attorney what are you doing when you see that second video i mean i think part of the charge right there is that an officer was injured uh maybe that officer needs to get a little better training come on now. <laughs> uh but Poor guy, huh? it, it's it's difficult to face those facts but we need to focus i think the defense will focus on she was free to do whatever she wants to do she can go to Costa Rica, she can get plastic surgery, she can Google whatever she wants. Nobody told her, no, you must stay here. She wasn't under arrest. She is free to live her life, and these are just a bunch of coincidences. And Maybe a little too many. <laughs> Doesn't sound too innocent to me. <laughs> just the greatest coincidences ever. A very ill-timed vacation, yeah, according to Sudi Chetty. And then his little plastic lot, yeah. surgery on the trip, you know, maybe poorly timed as well. Uh, the selling of the Jeep, you know, the Jeep spotted outside the home. So she unloads the Jeep. That's another thing that looks suspicious. Using her sister's passport, that was another fact. We knew that prior to trial. Charles? This, this, this is full of bad facts. I mean, this is really about as bad as it can get in terms of um, when you are evaluating the good and the bad facts. I, I, I'm struggling to even contemplate no, it's any good Sudi, facts. You, you say it with a straight face, Sudi, but that's <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, no, can no, you stand no. up in front of a jury and say with a straight face, so what? I don't know that I could with those this facts. Is a, a cornucopia of Sorry. bad facts. A cornucopia of bad facts. It is, yes. Charles. It there is. is. The prosecutor is doing a good job in, in laying down those the, that foundation for their evidence because it just, yeah. like it, in law school, they, they, y'all, y'all, you're a professor. Yeah, you just, teach us a, a brick is not a wall, but you put brick by brick by brick, right. and then you build your wall of evidence. I call it a buffet. A lot of bricks. I call it a buffet. A buffet. A buffet of bad evidence. Yeah. No, it really is. Uh, and my understanding, if if she is 
convicted. She's already let the court know that she would want the jury to decide the penalty phase. If, if she is convicted, she's still cloaked in the presumption of innocence. Of course, the state of Texas has the burden, but yeah, apparently she's let the court know she doesn't want it to be the judge. Why do you think that, Charles? Tell uh, us. I think just <clears throat> in the last couple of decades and the advent of, uh, you know, the good work of the Innocence Project and all of the exonerations that are so much higher profiles than they, than they used to be, that um, juries are increasingly cognizant of the fact that mistakes are made and they don't want to be a part of the mistake. And that is a daunting burden to put on, um, you know, in a, uh, uh, on civilians, on citizens, right, to decide whether someone gets to choose to live or to die. And most people don't want to be a part of that decision, and so and they I defer. Sh and I should clarify, it's not a death penalty case. Oh, it's not. A it's death not. Penalty. No. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, but just I some states. No, no, no. That's okay. Because some states will. Um, allow for a jury to uh, make a sentencing recommendation. So, yeah. But it still makes sense, Charles, because I judges do this all day long. And after a while, I can send somebody to jail for life. I did it last week. I did it the week before. <laughs> mm -hmm. For 12 people on a jury, it's, it's a hard decision. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Uh, I wish we could see what's going on in that courtroom with the evidence presentation. In Court TV, for anybody who's wondering, we wanted to be there. We applied to be there, and the court has restricted us to just showing the opening statements, the closing arguments, and the verdict. Uh, this was uh, the prosecutor uh, and defense counsel. Prosecutors on the left in the blue suit, defense counsel's on the right. Uh, both gave passionate, fiery opening <laughs> Opening statements, you can tell these guys are very seasoned lawyers. So, Caitlin Armstrong does have excellent representation. Uh, this gentleman is putting up quite a fight for her. We know that based on some of what he said in the opens. And we do have one of our producers in the courtroom every day sending us notes. That's how we know about that ring doorbell video and other evidence coming in. So, we're going to keep you posted uh, throughout the day on Court TV Live as well.